OK, so we left off talking a little bit about how to encode instructions in a VLIW, or how are VLIWs encode instructions. And as you may recall, in a VLIW uh, instruction encoding, you have a very long instruction work. So it could be, I don't know, many, many bytes. So if you go look at something like the multi-flow processors, the multi-flow trace processors, they had very long instruction uh, words. They could, I think, execute something like, tw uh, in their largest machine configuration, 20-some instructions. And <clears throat> they had to encode this. But one of the challenges was that you didn't necessarily want to have all that encoding space used all the time. So if you are executing a simple instruction or something which doesn't actually uh, need all the encoding space, you end up with a whole lot of no-ops. Or if you have a very long dependency string in your execution uh, tr trace, if you will, so you have an instruction which is dependent on the next instruction, which is dependent on the next instruction, which is dependent on the next instruction, and you cannot fill any of the extra slots, you're going to end up having a lot of no-ops in your program. So how do we go about solving this? A couple, couple different uh, solutions here. Um, Sidra 5 went off and added a particular instruction, which is a single operation instruction, and used uh, a much smaller amount of memory. So this would effectively reduce your instruction cache pressure. <clears throat> there was compressed formats in memory, so you can hold your instruction sequences in memory, and then when you go and pull it into your instruction cache, it would expand to the uh, fully expanded version. And this is kind of like a compression algorithm. You're basically compressing your VLIW instruction sequences because otherwise these things are very, very large and have lots and lots of zeros or no-ops in them because the probability you're going to fill sort of 20 instructions per cycle is low, but you want that capability there in case you actually do want to execute 20 instructions per cycle. <clears throat> Another solution here is um, what's actually used in the Intel Itanium or IA64 processor line and also the, uh, the TI DSPs, the C6000 series, they, they have um, the ability to effectively mark where a bundle starts and stops. So it's something sort of between a variable length instruction and a fixed format VLIW instruction. So we'll talk more uh, later in today's class about how IA64 or uh, Intel's Itanium handles this. But roughly what happens is they have a fixed instruction format and um, you can fit sort of three instructions per bundle or what they call a bundle and then if you want to go over that, you can keep going over that and they have special bits in their instruction which says, oh, well this is going to uh, express some more parallelism later. Um, so you need to look at the next bundle and try to fetch that bundle and that's all can be executed parallel. So it's still a, a parallel execution semantics but um, the formats are not necessarily fixed. And this is sort of outside the bound of classical VLIW. Now it's going into a little bit more uh, modified VLIWs or, or more contemporary VLIWs. So today we're going to, uh, as I said, talk about how to go about getting all the performance that out-of-order super sailors can get, but in the context of a VLIW. So we're going to slowly build up all the different techniques that out-of-order super scalars have and all the ways that they can get instruction level parallelism, and then apply that inside of VLIW or how we make small changes to classical VLIWs to get a lot of the performance back. Okay, so let's talk about the first, the first trick here. One of the questions that comes up or the problems that comes up here is if you have branches and they mispredict, this can limit your instruction level parallelism in a VLIW. Okay, so why is this worse than in a out-of-order superscalar? Well, an out-of-order superscalar can dynamically schedule around branch mispredicts. So if you branch mispredict, um, you can basically schedule other code or speculatively schedule code depending on your prediction. <clears throat> but on something like a VLIW processor, that's a lot harder to do because you don't have a dynamic scheduling engine behind there. The compiler had to go do all that scheduling statically at compile time. So how do we, how do we go about fixing this? Well, one solution is just to eliminate all the hard to predict branches. So you take out the branches that might be hard to predict. So your branch predictor is trying really hard. 
you could still have a branch predictor in your VLIW processor, but some of these things you don't know. It's like a data-dependent branch. How do you know which way it's going to go? And you know, this is a problem even for superscalers, but at least in a superscaler, you can um, try to sort of backfill instructions or try to, try to do something or move around, if you will, loads or long latency instructions around branches in a super, in an out of order superscalar. You can potentially move a load beyond a branch. But in a VLIW processor, that's not easy to do because the compiler has to make that decision whether that branch is going to predict taken or not taken. And it may, that may change over the lifetime of the program. And it may also change as the, uh, uh, depending on the sort of input sets to the program. So it may not be something that's compiler time uh, even known, uh, knowable. OK, so our first technique here that we're going to use is called predication. So let's, let's define what predication is. Well, first of all, predication is a technique that allows you to basically change the result of a register based on some other register. And it's going to let us transform hard to predict branches into data flow or data dependencies. So we're going to add something to our instruction set. And it's going to take what looks like a uh, small branch or a short distance branch. And we're going to basically execute both sides of those branches or the taken and the non-taken code path, and then at the end, decide which one was the right one with a, something like a select operator from C. So this is like the question mark colon operator, which no one ever uses in C. This is sort of the equivalent of that, but we're going to do it in one instruction, or maybe two instructions. So let's, let's, let's take a look at uh, how this helps with small branch regions or branch re branches which are hard to predict. So we're going to introduce two instructions. And I also want to point out that predication sometimes shows up in uh, superscalers, uh, processors, or uh, uh, sequential instruction sets also. So a good example of this is two instructions very similar to this are actually in x86. They're called CMove, or conditional move. <clears throat> and we're going to introduce conditional move as the most basic form of predication. So let's look at the semantics of these two instructions we add for conditional move. First instruction here, move 0. So what does move 0 do? Well, move 0 tests whether one of these input operands here, RT, is equal to 0. And if it's equal to 0, it's going to move RS into the result register, or the destination register here. So it's going to move RS into RT, or RS into RD if RT is equal to 0. And if RT is not equal to 0, it's just going to leave RD alone. OK, well, on first appearances, that seems like a very simple instruction. It's basically just doing a, a copy operation. It's a, it's a gated copy. It looks a lot simpler than something like add or subtract. We don't have to do any math, at least. There's no compare. I mean, the, the compare is easy. It's just the equals. It's not a less than equals. So it's a pretty simple instruction. And we're also going to introduce move not zero. So it's kind of the complementary one of this. And we're going to want this because um, when we go to execute code, we're going to want to, let's say, have an if then else. And we're going to have, want to execute the, the, the then and the else the same time, or uh, roughly at the same time, or indiscriminately, not dependent on the branch. And at the end, we're going to decide which one was the correct one. And we need sort of two instructions here to choose, well, was, was the positive one the right one, or the one where the, the conditional value is true or false, the right one, or the one where it was true, or vice versa. So move not zero. Move not zero is going to do the same thing here. It's going to see. Uh, except the sense of the, of the condition code is going to be different. It's going to sense if uh, RT is not equal to 0. And if RT is not equal to 0, then RS is going to go into RD. Else, we're just going to leave RD alone with the original value of RD. OK, so let's, let's walk through a, a quick code example here. 
and see, see how this uh, helps. So here we have a code example. We have some C code. We have non-predicated MIPS-like assembly code. And then we have a MIPS-like assembly code here with these fancy two predication instructions. And they're all, all three of these are doing the same thing. So let's, let's look at this piece of code here in the C code. It's probably the easiest to understand. It's going to start off, um, and it's going to say, if A is less than B, so as a condition, and then there's a then and an else. So what does this actually implement? Well, this is a minimization function, or a min function. X gets the minimum of A or B. If A is less than B, it gets A. If A is greater than B, it gets B. So it's going to assign to X the smallest value of A and B. And these sort of if-then-elses, uh, you can see here it's pretty short. We don't have a whole lot of code in either the, the then case or the else case. And that's going to be important in a second. You'll see why. Um, mainly it revolves around if you have lots and lots of code or one of the sides of the branches is, is, is long, it may not make sense to actually predicate this because there's some cost to predication. OK, so here, here's some assembly code. Does a similar sort of thing. Set less than. This is a comparison operation in MIPS. So we're going to do set less than. And these are going to be R2 and R3 are going to have our two uh, A and B values here. If it's less than, we're going to put it into R1. If not, this gets set to 1 or 0. And then we have a branch uh, 0 here, effectively. Um, what is this? This is a branch. OK, so branch equal with 0. It's a little odd. We probably should have just put branch 0 there instead. Um, but it's going to check to see whether this value is 0 or 1. And if it's the one direction, it's going to jump to L1. If it's the other direction, it's going to fall through and then jump over this move. And these two moves here are the two assignment operators, the uh, x equaling A or x equaling B. OK, that's, that's not so bad. Let's analyze how long this takes, how many uh, cycles this will take to execute on a, on a sequential machine. OK, it does this set less than. It's one. It does this branch. So that's two. Let's say the branch is not taken or falls through. Three, four, and then the jump over. So it's going to be. Uh, one, two, three instructions in the one, let's, is that right? One, two, three, four instructions in the one case. And the other case, it's going to take the branch and jump to here. So it's going to be one, two, jump over all the stuff, three instructions. OK, that's, that's not so bad. So the one case is four and the other case is three. They're different. Now, something else that makes this interesting is let's say this branch is mispredicted. It's a data-dependent branch, A and B. So what is, what's a good thing to predict here? Can our branch predictor do a good job on this? Hmm. I don't know. It depends on what you know about A and B. If the compiler knows nothing or the hardware knows nothing, you're not going to be able to do a particularly great job. Um, so let's say it's a data-dependent branch, and it's 50% the one direction and 50% the other direction. Is this going to slow down our execution? Well, sure. It's going to slow down our execution because all of a sudden, when we take a branch, um, one of the directions, whichever way we predict, um, the mispredict path is going to add some mispredict penalty. So instead of the one path being three and the other path being four, let's say the branch is predicted uh, oh, I don't know. Let's say the branch is predicted not taken. So it predicts the fall through case. So all of a sudden, the fall through case is going to be one, two, three, four instructions. And let's say we have a two cycle branch mispredict penalty. So let's look at the other case. So the other case is going to be one, two, and then two cycles of mispredict. So that gets us up to four. We're going to branch over five. So it's going to be five cycles. So all of a sudden, we have our branch mispredict penalty coming into the equation here of 
And, and you know, two-cycle branch misprediction is relatively uh, benign. If, you, if that starts to grow longer, then you really start to have problems with this. OK, so let's take this code sequence and look about how to, how to predicate it. So if we're going to go predicate this, we're actually going to execute both sides regardless of the value of the uh, if clause or the conditional clause here. So if we look what we do, we actually have restructured the code here a little bit. And this is our compare. This is our if still up here. We have a set less than. And then we say if uh, r1 is 0, move r2 to r4. Else, just leave it alone. And then here, if r1 is not 0, move r3 to r4. And what's important to note here is this non-destructive operation, especially here in this last instruction, is really important. Because if the move 0 was uh, executed and that copied a new value into r4, and then this move not 0 were to somehow change r4, you lose that result from this previous one. So this really depends on these operations being non-destructive if, if, their, if their condition is, is not true. OK, so let's, let's analyze this from a, a number of instructions perspective. First question is, does this matter what happens to the branch or what happens to the condition? Is it going to have different numbers of instructions or different numbers of cycles uh, dependent on the the direction of the, the condition. Well, no, there's no branch. Nothing's going to change. So in all cases, this is just going to take three cycles. So all of a sudden, we transform something which can take, as I said, uh, if, let's say you have a branch misprint penalty, four cycles or five cycles. <clears throat> so on average, let's say the branch is taking 50% of the time in either direction. Uh, we'll, we'll split the difference there, and we'll call it four, four and a half cycles on average. But we've turned it into something which takes three. Well, that's a great win. <clears throat> so where, where else is this useful? Um, does you always need to have if-then-else clauses to make this work out? So no. Um, this also works good for small code hammocks. So I say a small code hammock is just an if which jumps around a small piece of code. And if you can't predict that if very well, um, then it makes sense just to go execute effectively what's inside that uh, code hammock or that small piece of code always. If, 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 for instance, you have two instructions inside of a code hammock and your mispredict penalty is like 10 cycles and you don't know whether the, the branch is being taken 50% of the time either way, all of a sudden your average mispredict penalty is going to be something like five cycles. You could have just executed the code in the middle. It would have been faster. You could have executed the two instructions and then just done a conditional move at the end, and that would have been uh, and basically always better. <clears throat> OK, so we bring up some questions here. What if the if then else has lots of instructions? Hmm. So let's say we have the if then else here, but there's a thousand instructions here and a thousand instructions there. Should we? predicate this. Let's say the branch mispredict penalty, as I said, five, or no, it's 10 cycles. And it's 50% either way. But there's 1,000 instructions in the if, uh, uh, the, the then clause and the else clause. Well, no, that would, that would never make sense to do. Because <clears throat> you're basically doubling your code, and there's a lot of code there. Um, you'd be better served by just doing the branch because you'd be taking something that was, uh, could be 1,000 instructions and turning it into always 2,000 instructions or doubling the number of instructions executing, executing um, versus just adding, let's say, 10 cycles of branch mispredict penalty or an average five cycles of branch mispredict penalty to your 1,000 that you have to execute. So all of a sudden, you're, you're adding a little overhead so where, where this predication really helps is sort of for small pieces of code where you don't necessarily know uh, the branch outcome uh, or can't predict the branch outcome very well. OK, what if the, the code is unbalanced? 
So you have an if, then, and an else. But the then clause and the else clause are very different in size. So one is three instructions, and the other is a thousand instructions. Does this make sense? Well, it goes back to the same argument we had before uh, with the very large if then else clauses. If the code is really unbalanced, you have a lot in the then clause and a little bit in the else clause or something like that, and let's say the branch is taking 50% of the time, it might make sense just to use the, uh, an actual branch there and deal with the mispredict penalty costs versus trying to uh, somehow predicate it. Because the effect what's going to happen is, let's say you have three instructions and a thousand instructions on the two different sides. You're going to be adding, you're going to be executing, if you predicate, uh, a thousand and three instructions every single execution time, plus maybe some sort of conditional moves at the end, some overhead involved. <clears throat> Versus if you have 50-50 and you have to add a little bit of a branch overhead penalty, your 50-50 is gonna, 50-50 uh, chance is gonna say, well, I'm taking 1,000 plus three, and I'm gonna add those two things together and take the average of them, basically. So, you know, it's gonna be, uh, what's the average of that? It's gonna be like 501 or something like that, or 502 cycles. And that's gonna be better than always executing 1,000 uh, cycles. Let's see, anything else we wanted to say here? Um, yeah, one, one, one last thing I wanted to say here before we move off this slide. Move zero and move not zero, or sometimes called C-move, conditional move instructions, are what are called partial predication. And we're now gonna move on to full predication, where we can actually put conditions on every single instruction in our register. Uh, every single instruction in our ISA. But this is a little bit easier to do than full predication. This is sort of the first step that people typically implement. And it's called partial predication. And just to, just to hammer this home one more time, predication is really turning what was control flow into a data flow operation or a data operation. Okay, so let's take a look at full predication. Full predication, we're actually going to change the instruction set such that all the instructions can be, or almost all the instructions are executed conditionally based on some predic predicate. If the predicate is false, the instruction is not going to do anything. It's just not going to have any, any side effect. So let's look at a, a code sequence here. So in this code sequence, we have an if, then, and an else, and then some code uh, after, after we're done. So here we have if. A little bit different, uh, this is not actually in MIPS code, this is something, uh, just sort of pseudocode here. But it's gonna say, this is our if here, if A is equal to B, then branch to B2, else fall through, here we're going to execute our else clause, and when we're done, we're gonna branch over the then clause. So not, not, not anything interesting here. Four basic blocks, I don't know if we've introduced this term yet in, the, in this class, but I wanted to <clears throat> introduce a, the term basic block. Basic block are, uh, is, a, is a piece of code which has strictly one exit point and one entry point. So uh, you could enter it from other places. You can jump to it from other pieces of code. But once you enter the piece of code, you're going to execute the code all the way to the end, and then there's uh, one place you can leave. So you can either jump to someplace else or branch, and you can, you can fall out to, to two different places. But the exit point is only one place. So we're, what we're going to make the differentiation here is the piece of code can have, for instance, two branches. That, that's not called a basic block. That, that's called a, a bigger type of block, but this is a compiler term. And it's just good to know. Okay, so let's apply full predication here. So these are relatively short code hammocks. Two instructions here, two instructions there, and 
two instructions in the else, two instructions in the then clause. This looks like a uh, really great, great place to think about predicating. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the, the predication here. And, and I want, before, we, before we do that, I wanted to just say that the, one of the big reasons that we're trying to predicate on a VLIW in particular is in a VLIW, we have lots of extra, or we could potentially have extra parallel execution slots. So in our instruction sequence, or instruction encoding, we have extra places to put uh, code. So it may not actually hurt us to, to predicate. Because a lot of times when we go to predicate, we're basically going to execute both sides of the if, then, and else. And it's bad if we have to execute both sides of the if, then, and else, and they're big sequentially. But if you try to sort of slide them up next to each other, if you have extra no-op slots or extra slots in your VLIW, you can actually decrease the, the critical path through your program. So let's uh, look at this. And we're actually going to do this in this example. So in this example here, we took this piece of code and added full predication. So when we say full predication, we added some extra things to these instructions. They look a little strange at first. So here we have instruction 3, instruction 4, instruction 5, instruction 6. And these are the same ones that were back over here. But instead, we added some extra words in front of them here, or these, these parentheses uh, uh, with P's in front of it. What that is, is these are predicate registers. So we're going to add a second register file into our processor where we can store effectively one-bit values, sort of true or false values, that are going to determine whether this instruction executes or doesn't execute. Excuse me. Um, so what this means is, if P1 is 1, execute this. If P1 is 0, uh, nullify this instruction 3 here. And we have, we have a double pipe here. What am I trying to show with this? Well, I'm trying to show that this is parallel. This and this are executing at the same time, because we have a very long instruction word processor. We can execute multiple things at the same time. And what we've done here is we actually slid this up next to the, the then up next to the else, and we're going to execute them at the same time, dependent on these predicates. So this is the else block, and this is the then block. We're going to execute concurrently. OK. Um, sort of stuff before the if, stuff after the if then else is all done. So that's sort of from that, that four basic block example. Um, What's this instruction? This instruction has very interesting semantics. And this is something that you probably have to add if you're going to try to have full predication. Hmm. OK, so let's compare. So this is our comparison. If A is equal to B, and then it writes into two outputs. Ooh, that looks broken. That looks wrong somehow. How can we have one instruction write to two things? And what is the semantics of it? What does it write to here and here? Well. What this is actually doing is this is writing the positive outcome of this compare to the one and the inverse or the, the negation of that to the other. And this is useful because then we can go use these predicates down here. We can use the, the positive one, let's say the negative one, and that can uh, drive whether we execute the sort of else clause or the then clause. So lots of instruction sets that have full predication have either something like this. This is one option. You can actually have sort of two outputs and you load two predicate registers. The other option is when you go to in actually encode the instructions, you have a sort of a not bit. So it denotes the predicate register. But when we denote the predicate register, we also uh, denote whether we take the predicate register being true as, or the predicate register being false as what drives whether the instruction executes in our full predication scheme. So in effect, this is computing P and P bar at the same time and running two different registers. And then we can use those separately down here. And <clears throat> interesting result here in uh, ISCA 95, Scott Malky showed that you can, on average, let's say, remove 50% of your branches by using full predication. Now, 
full predication is not easy to build. Um, very few instruction sets have actually had full predication. Uh, Itanium was probably the closest to a real processor that was built that has almost full predication. It doesn't have quite full predication. Um, the HP Plato instruction set, I think, actually had full predication. I think this is what Scott Malky was working with, or a derivative of that. Um, so you can actually have instruction sets that people have thought about that have had full predication, but not all things are easy. So first thing, you need to add an extra register file for the predicates. You need to bypass those predicates. You need to compute them. There's some overheads involved, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. 